Hasta luego. Mike, 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 Miggity Mike, how's everybody doing this evening on this uh, Tuesday, March the 26th, I believe it is, in the, the year of our Lord, 2024? <laughs> 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 what, are we, what are we doing today, man? So uh, let's do some housekeeping first, okay? So we got another versus today, a cut versus no cut, and sponsored by my man, Rossi Reptiles. Rossi underscore reptiles on Instagram. He's got some amazing products, some cool projects going on. And he just picked up probably one of the coolest animals at the Tinley show. So you got to follow him and check it out. So everybody's general consensus other than like the big, you know, Justin reveals and stuff like that was pretty much the star of the show and uh, something that Rice Reptiles uh, produced. And I also got an animal for Rice Reptiles at all. I mean, also, I got that uh, GHI Mojave Clown. Um, to put into the Hellbender project, but we'll talk about that another time. So, um, but with me are two of my nearest and dearest friends. We got my man Moose from Great Balls of Fryer, and we got the homie Tyler from Tyler's Toxic Balls. How you doing tonight, gentlemen? Man, we're making it, dude. Trying to make a dollar out of fifteen cent. I hear that, man. That's all. That's what we all can do, man. Who's all? I mean. Looks like you guys brought your whole crowd tonight, man, because some of these people I don't even recognize. So look at you guys with your, with your, with your whole crew. <laughs> Troy's in the house, Key's in the house, JQ Balls, Fable Creations, Macklemore. So I didn't forget about you, bro. I still uh, looking through your list and trying to figure out what we're going to do with your stuff. Anna, what's happening? Man, a bunch of people in here. So, man, uh, hopefully we got a good one tonight for you guys. It'll be pretty entertaining. But um, before we move on with like the big, big stuff, you guys want to talk about your business and what you got going on with your projects and stuff. Tyler, you can go first. Yeah, man. Uh, this season is is looking a little slow, a little late. Uh, Everyone's but, is. Bro. <laughs> I'm on um, clutch. I'm on clutch two, and it's about to be April. I got none. I got one girl who should lay by the end of the week, but you know, most of my stuff this year is is double, triple recessive stuff a lot of clown pied stuff this year and uh a lot of monarch stuff too so actually okay. shout out to troy i bought a monarch pied female and a monarch cat pied female from him last week so i'll be picking those up in dallas but i got uh, a few other clutches five or six other clutches of monarch stuff i'm super excited about this week or this year and yeah just a ton of ton of cool stuff hoping for 30, 40 clutches, and uh, yeah, all stuff I'm going to want to be keeping, so we'll see. I might have 100 holdbacks this year. <laughs> you got you got all that holdback space? Yeah, I mean, I got I got enough space for now. I'm probably, the next thing I've been talking talking about getting is, uh, what is it, a 130 hybrid or something? It's mm -hmm. the five series bins from ARS. Yeah. I, think one. I think they'll be nice to have, and uh, maybe another like 18 rack or, uh, sorry, a ARS 10 rack. I have a Vision Sea Serpents 18 rack that I keep a lot of the stuff grow ups in. But yeah, I'm hoping this year will be pretty good. It's looking like I'll have one clutch now, and in two months, I might get 30 clutches in a month because all the girls are at the same follicle size. So yeah, I got right. Like, I think normally, as soon as I get one in the incubator, man, it just starts going, you know. So I got. One girl is going in a prelay shed, another is ovulating, and every, everybody else is between like 18 to 25 millimeters. So I'm hoping we just get a big chain reaction and it just go, 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 go the rest of the year. Me too. So, Me too. Uh, Moose, what about you, man? So we're on uh, it right now. I just, um, there's my first redhead clutch of the year is, is, about 85 percent out i got mm -hmm. three that just kind of want to hang out in the egg but uh the other five are out so we're, we're looking good on adding some more stuff some more quality clean stuff to the redhead project stuff like so we're taking it slow um i am going to have some head stuff this year but it might be for me to keep mm -hmm. to myself but 
as of right now, that's that's going and going well with us. This is supposed to be our year um, when we decide to do this back in uh, 2019, 2018, 2019. Right. Uh, we had made the decision to never buy breeders. So we went with babies and everything that's going this year is something that I had in my pocket at one time before because it was a little baby. So uh, everybody's mature. Everybody's ready to go. Um Right now in my incubator is the most I've ever had in a season. So we're already looking uh, pretty nervously anxious here. I'm um, <laughs> looking at possibly uh, 50 to 80 clutches when it's all said and done. I'm hoping that I have a little bit of stuff for everybody, especially with the redhead folks, because redhead's where it's at, man, in my, in my brain. So hopefully I'll have some stuff I'll be able to release, but if not, I'll at least have some stuff to brag about come Tinley. Nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that uh, redhead Batman I got from Miguel last year. One day he just woke up and he was like, let's go. Like, I stuck him with some females and, you know, I was like, all right, let me see. How I went, like, dropped him off at the tub, went to the bathroom, came back, locked. I'm like, huh? <laughs> he took him apart, fed him, uh, you know, a little rat pup or fuzzy, whatever like that. Like I do, like I dog treat all of my males. A couple days later, put him back in another female, boom, locked. I'm like, all right, now we in business, man, so. Oh, yeah. So he said he's doing his thing. So I have a lot of like, you know, redhead clown stuff. And um, I have some uh, redhead double head DG clown stuff, too. So um, I'm curious to see what that's like, too, because I'm putting stranger and redhead into those like DG G stripe clown realm of stuff. You know, like mm -hmm. that's like my biggest triple recessive project right now. And yeah. this year, like a whole lot of um, a whole lot of like starters for that project. So I have enhancer G stripe you know, head clowns, G-Stripe clown head enhancers and everything, you know, everything in between. So, um, and I can't keep them all. So some of them would be available. <laughs> they got to go somewhere. <laughs> they'll, they'll go somewhere. But, you know, fortunately I have a um, good customer base and um, between my Patreon members and my followers, like they kind of know what I have going on. So a lot of this stuff, like, you know, you're not supposed to count your chickens before they hatch, but a lot of this stuff, like, the best middle and worst stuff in the clutches that I've let go is already like sold essentially, you know? So, yeah. And, then, uh, and then, you know, that sunset puzzle, white whale trying again, she's, she's getting big and building. So um, hopefully, you know, I can, I can get a mail or something like that this year and put with a bunch of projects. And, but with shed testing, I ain't gonna lie y'all that double head mail. I've been a little loosey, loosey goosey putting him to some other things too. You know what I mean? Because now you can, you know, you can test for puzzle. You can test for sunset. So I'm putting him to like some of my um my less expensive codom stuff, and just kind of trying to yeah. put a bunch of genes into the project, and just rolling the dice, man, and seeing and seeing uh, where we go with it. So um, got it's so much more to do with that project. So he get I'm already putting him with like other visual recessive stuff, so ultra male stuff, lavender stuff, and yeah, it's gonna Ultra be crazy. Ultra we decided to to go super slow. With our with our puzzle project stuff, I've got a really good pair uh, that are breeding now that I got from Clint Conway uh, with Wine Country Reptiles, big shout out to Clint. But uh, we're hoping to get some stuff going. So, but we'll have the we'll have the firepower to back it up once we get something visual from them to roll right back into the other projects. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about the puzzle stuff. Dude, during, during my move to North Carolina, everything made it here fine except for two things. My high desert python cup and my mutation creation coffee cup shattered for some reason. So I gotta go old Spider-Man right here. You know, old faithful has got me through a lot of podcasts and stuff too, man. Oh, <laughs> um, you guys in like Marvel and stuff like that? Have you watched the X-Men series yet? Very. I'm holding out on the 96 because I don't know if they put up did they put the whole 97 series out at once? No, they put the first two episodes out last yeah. week. I'll and, wait. And that's bro, all. I'll, let me I'll be so let mad. Me, let me tell you right now. This show, they set it up, is not meant for kids. This is not like, oh, this is my first time getting the X-Men. Oh, let me watch this. This is the people no. like us who watched it yeah. back in the day. So, Tyler, before you get into this, you need to go on Disney Disney Plus and watch the X-Men series from the 90s. I'm telling you because it leads off right after the last episode. See, yeah, I didn't I didn't so, watch the original. I'm not. Yeah. No, 30, yeah, so, go, so, so I'm telling you, man, go back and watch the original, man. Uh, like, you will love it. And do like when... I'm not going to really spoil it for everybody else, you know what I mean? But if you're in the chat and you already watched the first two episodes, leave some fire emojis in the comments. But, man, when Magneto gave his little speech, I was sitting there like this. 
yeah, I know, I understand. Like, <laughs> it's like it, it, it was just, it was just so cool, man. You know what I mean? And just, um, I'm a big fan of nostalgia, so anything that reminds me of like the innocent, good old days when I was a kid, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, always puts a smile on my face. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Marvel, so. love Marvel stuff, but I haven't watched the original, and I, I struggle with like letting shows out weekly because I'm spoiled and just like to watch yeah. all. At the same time, uh, you so didn't have to, to, you didn't have to grow up with mandatory commercials, man. And oh, actually to, you Not didn't really have to worry about getting home getting home on time to watch your favorite music video because, like, I just run home from high school in '96 and be like, "Oh man, I gotta get home before they show Wu Tang Clan Shadow Boxing video again." And uh, <laughs> hook up the camcorder to record the TV mm -hmm. so you can watch it when you want. Yep. So, man, uh, I didn't get that. So I've been struggling with like Invincible. You know, yeah, I heard it was good, man. I'm uh, I'm gonna get on it eventually, man. When I uh, that's a tough one. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's tough. I love that's it. That's a good. It's a good one, but it's just tough. I'm that's another one. I'm waiting till the end of the season. I'm just gonna watch. Like, like I watched that weekly, and I just wish they let five seasons out at the same time. Oh, they, took a, they, they took a three month break between episode like four and five because of yeah. like, holiday time. Yeah, yeah. Suck. So the tough. yeah. Tyler, you're 18, 19? Just turned 19 in January. January what? 20th. Oh, you're a couple weeks younger than my youngest child. <laughs> okay. My daughter just turned 19 January 5th. So, Whole, oh. holy crap, man. Me, me and your dad was getting busy the same time. <laughs> 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 yo, yo, shout out to Pops, man. Where's he at? Uh, <laughs> He's upstairs getting ready for a trip. He's leaving tomorrow for uh for Florida. So dude, man, uh, like dude, yeah. you are so freaking lucky to have a dad like him, man, that's supportive of what you do, man. And and it's like putting them like spending money, you know what I mean, on these projects and like helping you like realize your passion, man. You know, um my biggest um the biggest support of my life growing up with Daniel was my mom, bro. Like just because I was a good student growing up and I didn't get into any trouble. My mom always trusted my judgment. So when I was like, hey, I want to try leopard frogs, she was like, go ahead, baby, get some leopard frogs. Just I better not find them in my kitchen. I'm eating them. You know, just some like dumb shit like that. You know, so um when I was doing uh Northern Browns uh, in New Jersey, she like bought me like a 60-gallon tank. It was like, yeah, just if you catch them, just put them in here and set them up how you want to. And I help you, you know, like sell them and stuff like that too. So mom, man, she was always cool with that, man. And she always was just like, look, man, you're going to try a whole bunch of things in your life. You know what I mean? A lot of them are going to fail. <laughs> but she always told me, she was just like, um, you never want to be on your deathbed singing your shoulda, coulda, wouldas, you know? Oh, yeah, because, absolutely. Yeah, like your limitations, too. And um, because, you know, because the way she grew up, she didn't have a lot of opportunities for a lot of things. And she made sure that, you know, me and my siblings did. She was just always like, hey, look, go out there. You don't have to be conventional. You don't have to get a nine to five if you don't want to. You know what I mean? Like she knows that my whole entire life was martial arts and animals. And the fact that I'm almost into my 50s. And get ready, you know what I mean. And that's how this is how I make a living. You know what I mean. My main source of income is you know the, the martial arts business and reptiles. So you got I mean, oh, um, six Olympics to come before you turn fifty, bro. Don't even start talking <laughs> like that about the turn fifty. Uh, I feel, I'm, bro. I'm telling you, man. When I get out the bed and these fucking ligamentless knees fucking start to clicking, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, I'm right there. Okay. I'm right there. It sounds like a bag my, of marbles when I walk up the steps. My, my, my dog's jumping up out the, out the way because they hear some clacking in the morning and shit. Nah, that's just pops <laughs> getting up, man, trying to get to the door. Firewalks up, uh, firework. Oh, uh, but yeah, man. So, um, and then like as a snake breeder, um, starting off, like I said, uh, I had like those DK snakes, and they were all just live bearers. So, the I didn't the first species that I dealt with that had eggs were ball pythons. And when I started looking into ball pythons back in the day and I found Brian Barchek's videos, all I knew was egg cutting, you know, like he had like the little box razors. He just pop them out, just <laughs> whatever like that and pull up. But like, so, uh, yeah. so, so that culture was ingrained in me early. So, so I mean, like, so and it was just something I was used to. I never questioned. I just, you know, learned, okay, hey, this is the time you should cut them. And this is why yeah. there's a whole bunch of reasonings that people had why they cut eggs and then eventually i found 
a whole subculture of people that were like, no incubators. I'm going to keep my pastels and my spiders on, <laughs> yeah. on the mom the whole time. And I'm going to put some moss around them. And that's how it has to be. And that's the only way it can be. Mm -hmm. And if they don't do it like I do, we don't buy animals from them. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it was always those extremes. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, you would see people like cut stuff early and you see much like bloody eggs, which is so weird to me, like posting yeah. like these bloody clutches and stuff. Yeah. Too. They just like hacked and massacred these things at day 39 and yeah. you know, so and and it's always fell to either one side or the other with people and I know there's a lot of people in the middle that's like, hey, I don't care what you do with your animals. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but there's a lot of people who for whatever reason now don't cut at all. And then there's some people that's always going to cut no matter what. So um, right. for today, we're going to talk about Tyler's going to be team. I cut my eggs and Moose is going to be team. Nah, bro. Let them bad boys pip on their own. <laughs> no, no cut. So, um, no cut. So Moose, have you always not have you always not cut your eggs or like what, what brought you into the into team? No cut. Well, the main the main thing was, you know, I decided back in probably around 2007 or 2008 that I was going to try to make this be a hobby. And uh, so, oh, you know, I'm back to the boa file days and the, and the, the uh, ball python.net talks where uh, you were getting those people that were in the game way before that. And that just wasn't a thing. You know, there wasn't a YouTube uh, for us to be able to brag about, you know, taking pick taking videos and watching us cut the things up and really look like Supreme films, you know, with people in there like this with, you know, cutting eggs and stuff. But that wasn't the thing, you know, the thing was, wait, oh, wait, 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 stop real quick. So you, you were a ball pythons dot net back in the day. Oh yeah. Back in 07, 08, when I decided so, to make so, it a hobby. So yeah. were you, so were you username great balls, three, four, five, six, that told me to go back to breed pit bulls, Jamal. Was that no, 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 no. <laughs> It was uh, it, and it's I, funny because my name is still you. there. <laughs> my name is still there, but it was called Woodbine's Finest Ball Pythons. That's what Dude, my thing was my back in the day. Still, my account still works on Ball Pythons. .net. Yeah, yeah, and that's it's funny because uh, I got it. It you know I just got the same cell phone number I had. My cell phone number was my beeper when I was sixteen. So that shows mm -hmm. shows how. But like you know, it was it, that was just what was ingrained to me. It more than it was. It wasn't something that was being done as far as like a business. It was still something where people were doing it as a hobby, and you know, maybe I'll sell a little bit on the side kind of thing. It wasn't like something like setting out the starting their LLCs and you know and stuff like that. And and uh, you know, there was no such thing as YouTube. So I think mainly you know, that's just because that was what was ingrained to me. And when I finally did decide uh, in 15 and 16, when I was starting to get together my, my 10 year plan to be able to leave uh, the job that I've got now, um, that's the first thing I said was, you know, when I, when I get back into this, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it the way that was ingrained in me. And that was just, you know, leave them be. And just over time I did research. I mean, I did do my research, you know, when you just start, diving down that rabbit hole that we all call YouTube. Uh, yeah. That's all you see. You see Brian Parchek cutting, cutting eggs. You see people cutting eggs with their scissors that they would normally cut yarn with. I mean, they're, you know, just whatever. Um, and I get it. I, I totally get that they want to be able to do that. Uh, the main reason that just stuck out in my brain was that, um, you know, it's there's there's something that's going on all the way up until they come out that egg that's doing something to either make them thrive better or making their immunity system better. All that amutrin and all that yolk and stuff like that, that was stuff that was given to their mother mother to make them be a strong animal. You know, and the last thing I want to have to deal with is, you know, when I'm dealing with 10 or 15 babies at a time that I've got two or three that just, you know, aren't up to the to the to the chase but for whatever reason being sick or not one to eat or what like that so it seemed like to me i was getting a lot more statistically i was getting a lot more better animals when i just you know let them come out on their own i let snake jesus decide whether or not i was going to have that baby or not because so, if it didn't pip then it was good you know it wasn't meant to be so when you did cut what were you seeing when you cut though from your experience well from i i just didn't like the idea and it's not necessarily that i cut Per se, um, the couple of times that I did cut before I totally decided, hey, look, this is we're just going to let it we're going to let it run with what nature intends. 
Um, the main thing that I would see is, you know, some of the stuff that like the older people were telling me, the older people in the hobby or the P I say older people, the people that have been in the hobby as a business a lot longer than me, uh, because mainly I'm seeing anything. It's almost like in my brain, I'm seeing mother's milk or the colostrum that babies need to get stronger. All that stuff is still in that egg for them to absorb. And if I'm, not given the opportunity to get those nutrients, I'm already putting one one foot in the grave, you know? So right. I wanted to be able to give them the fighting chance. I bred them for a reason. There's not something here we don't breed that we don't have a purpose, like we say, purpose-driven genetics. So I want to make sure everything gets exactly what they're supposed to, you know, and, and, and cutting them early and then run the risk of stuff getting out that is ultimately going to help them in the long run, I, it just wasn't worth it to me. So um, besides, like, obviously, like, rotted out eggs and things like that and stuff that go to mostly to term, what's your hatch rate now? I have lost one animal since I have gone in. And we're, we're a little bit over 100 eggs altogether wow. so far since I've, since I've started doing clutches recently. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I've changed from when I clutched out when I, was, when I was younger to now is just some of the scientific stuff that people do, like with the hatch trays and stuff like that. I don't do the whole in in the um, in the media like I used to, and some people still do to this day. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you what do you do right now? I just basically I, I either use a dragon hatch tray that I've got uh, with just any kind of media that I've got. I think right now I've just got some uh, whatever the darker version is. I, I'm hearing some weirdness on you, and that might be um, I think you slowing down or something like that. So this is like yeah. real grainy. Yeah. I'm getting Tyler. Ready. Yeah, Tyler, talk. Yeah, go ahead. Let me try to figure out what's going on. Yes, yeah, sure. Just try to reset and come back in. I'll let you in in a second. Okay. Tyler, what about you, man? How many uh how many clutches do you think you had so far? Um probably a little over 50, 55, mm -hmm. if I had to guess. And what's your routine now? Do you, what, what medium do you use or what temperatures and things like that? Use vermiculite. Uh, that's the only thing I use until about the last five clutches of, uh, 23. I just ran out and grabbed a bag of perlite and used that for the last couple clutches. But I use, uh, mostly vermiculite, uh, 88.5 to 89 on the temp in the incubator, uh, easy hatch tray and press and seal, put them in. Don't touch them until day 55 when I cut them. So do you always pick day 55 or is it a different look that you see in the eggs when you decide that you want to cut? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Usually 55, they look good. Obviously, there's times where I'll open them on 55 and I'll be like, ah, I'll wait another couple days. Or if I have clutches that are, you know, one or two days apart, sometimes I'll just I'll wait till one's on day 58 and one hits day 56 or day 55 and I'll just cut them both on the same day. Um, I don't find a difference in doing either. I, I've cut every clutch I've had except for, I think the first four. Mm -hmm. Um, and really the reason for that was it, it wasn't a big reason. I started when I started breeding snakes, I was 12. I got my first two clutches and my dad bred snakes when he was around my age and that's just the way he did it. Uh, so threw them right in vermiculite on the substrate and popped them in the incubator and let them be until I saw a head and let them all come out. So I did that the first two years and had no issues. Actually, one snake from one clutch had hard belly and I didn't know what it was and it passed mm -hmm. away. But other than that, everything was fine. I think I just, again, 14, 15 years old, got onto YouTube, started following, you know, some people learning new stuff and decided I wanted to start cutting my eggs and I've had no issues with it. Um, I struggle with, I've obviously I've lost some snakes and for me, it's hard to quantify like again with whatever it is, kinked animals, any incubation issues. It, it's hard for me to quantify if it would or wouldn't have happened any either way. Uh, that's one thing I, I struggle with with the, with the incubations and different methods is if it works for you, it works for you. You know what I mean? And with cutting, it's always worked for me. So 
stuck with it. It's, I'm always curious about that because, like, if you started off not cutting and then they hatch fine, I, it's always, like, made me curious to see, like, what would make you go over to actually start cutting now. Um, my first, I think, five clutches – were laid a week, like when I was away for work, like the very yeah. first time. So um, I had no idea when they laid. So it could have been like if I was gone for a five day week, you know, like I like do a full clean, do waters and stuff like that before I go. And in four to five days, you should be fine with any collection, you know. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. So um, my first few clutches, I popped open the incubator and or not the incubator, like um, pulled out the tray and they were wrapped around eggs. And I'm like, dang, these things are stuck together nice and tight. They can either be like. 24 hours in five days prior so i wouldn't know so i just put them in there hope for the best and then a lot of times they were already pipped and back then i used straight hatch right because i wasn't doing a lot of clutches like i do now so if i got three or four a year that was it so i bought the pre no hatch right stuff you just pour right on the egg bury them halfway close it set it and forget it man and then you know 56 57 days later you got little heads popping up so um i never to me, like, I never got that opportunity right away. And then it just turned to um, honesty with me. And I wanted to know if you agree with this, too. When I got to the point, I didn't really start cutting eggs until I started um, producing high dollar animals. I'm going to be honest with you, where there was stuff that, like, I saw stuff that people wanted and it was with the trend. And, like, uh, when I first started uh, breeding that first GHI male and I needed to hit this, 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 and this to make X amount of money or because I wanted to just trade these animals to get into the desert project back in the day. So that was the first time I started cutting. And I'm impatient as fuck. I'm not gonna lie with you, bro. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I cheat, I cheat, or I cheat Christmas time and like put a cut on the fucking on the gift wrap. So <laughs> I'm getting like I'm never going, I'm never gonna be surprised on Christmas Day unless you like have the shit out of the house. So uh for me it's just it honestly it's just being impatient man so um but in hindsight a lot of times when i've had problems i'm like dude i could have waited five days you know because if i did have an issue now i can't say whether or not it was the a cutting or not you know so um you know and us being like amateur scientists a lot of times you have to like kind of decide what's the common factor and when you have issues so for me I was just like, man, maybe cutting these eggs are giving me some of these issues, but that's still keep me from yeah. <laughs> that's still keep me from not cutting eggs, <laughs> right? <laughs> Shit. So, um, so Tyler, so you think the big issue? So the big issue I hear what people the non cutters say about people cutting eggs is because it's a money thing and it's greed and they're, and they're impatient. Do you do you do you agree on those two things? I. I personally disagree with it's a money thing. Mm -hmm. uh, with impatient, 110%. I think it's true for probably everyone who cuts eggs. I think Will said it earlier. Everyone admit we cut eggs because we're mm -hmm. impatient. I'm the most impatient person I know. So if I can cut, if I know what's in the egg at day 55 instead of 60, it just makes me feel better. And, but again, when I started cutting eggs, I was making four jeans with no hats. So yeah. it wasn't because because of the money and still now isn't like, oh, if I hit this, I can, you know, post it here and try and pre-sell it before it has a meal. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, I think the, the main reason I cut is probably just I can't wait until day 60 and I want to see what I got from these, you know, just crazy pairings I got now. And it... It does make it worse, I think, the better and better your pairings are and the more interested you get into them because, you know, now I sit – it's uh, – I'm between two different ways. I It hits day 55 quick because I get so many clutches, but, you know, when day 55 hits, it's like, okay, I want to cut them because I want to know what these – yeah. So what do you so what do you fall under the narrative that um a lot of people that justify their cutting says, well, because the snake may, may have an undeveloped egg tooth and it might not be able to get out. So um I have to cut the eggs because just in the in the infinitesimal event that they don't have an egg tooth, that the snake may drown. So I'm in turn saving his life. <laughs> do you buy that? I like you using the I like you using the voice there. That was good, man. You know, you made it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You make it totally that's, better. That's how that's how they all sound to me when I see yeah. when I see that type. Right. 
it's I want to hear I want to hear like Sarah McLaughlin in the background, the arms <laughs> of the angel while they're trying to make their like they make their big points about it. You so. you said it right. There's a minuscule chance that it happens. So I disagree that if that's the only reason you're cutting or if that's the reason you're putting it out there, you're lying to yourself and to the people you're telling. Uh, again, I haven't, I can't see an egg tooth, but I haven't seen a snake with or without one. I don't really look for it. Right. I've had snakes pip on day 55 or whatever. And I, I don't care. I'll cut the whole clutch and I've, yes. Have I untied umbilical cords that the snake might not have been able to get out of and save a snake? Yeah. But I don't know it like that's not a hundred percent uh you know it happens maybe twice three times a season out of you know 100 200 babies so if you cut a uh, day 55 or whatever and you still see a membrane in it do you pop that or you let them break them on its own no 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 i uh okay i've seen membranes and i don't pop them ever i usually just let them pop the membrane and I cut them on day 55 and then, yeah, I, I throw them back in there until they're all out of the egg and I don't really touch them again. So right, right. I, I just cut them to, to see what they are. I put them back and I don't bother them until they're out of the egg. I'll clean it, put them on wet paper towel, let them shed. And then it's, you know, wait a couple of days, set them up and feed them. So, you know. Hi, Moose. What, what about the narrative that, um, the only people, the only people who absolutely positively don't cut their eggs are, man, ain't nobody buying their shit no way. So that's why they don't cut their eggs because they have no idea <laughs> because right. they just have they just have a bunch of pet quality animals that they're just having for themselves. So it yeah, doesn't they, even matter to them. It doesn't even matter. They just to breed them. so much it doesn't so, matter what they've got yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, they just they just no. breed a, they just breed a bunch of cobra food anyway. And, yeah, <laughs> and, they're and usually that, the and ones. They're the ones that have the deli cups with the nets over them, you know, yeah. those, those people at the shows, you know, that's, that's, that's them. But, you know, I, I looked at it like this and we got a, in a pretty spirited conversation earlier with a voice chat with a bunch of my buddies on discord. Um, you know, and, and, and most of the people were saying, you know, it's, it's because I was impatient, you know, and stuff like that. And I looked at it like this and there was a good point that was brought up. You know, we've gone through this entire process. We've either bought this animal or we've made this animal with a purpose in mind, especially when we're getting up in the hygiene projects and stuff like that. So why are we going to risk a chance of something happening, you know, between day 50 and 60, when you've gone through all this breeding, this baby, getting this baby up to size and getting this male ready and making these parents and looking for these locks and then looking for the obbies and the prelay shit, just to pull the eggs and put them in there and run the risk that you can't wait five days to see what, what happens. You know, it's, there's not, there hasn't been a time when I've had a conversation where somebody has talked me out of not, not cutting, but I've had many conversations where people have talked me out of cutting. All right. So let's say you got a clutch, right? And some reason it's day 61, bro. Still nothing. Okay. I've got it right now. I get my stuff doesn't start my stuff doesn't start saying hello till day sixty day fifty nine I run mm. my incubator right at about eighty nine and my mm. inside ambient sits right at about eighty eight and a half that's that's something when I when I went to a bigger uh, incubator than just a normal put together homemade one uh, that I'd ran by will you know with Royal Canadian that's when he said hey that's what works for me t- tried and true uh, mm. so that's that's what we've stuck at I mean I know there's certain times that. I could have went up with the with the uh, percentage just to see if I could maybe get them before day sixty. Right. But at the same time, it's kind of like a if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, so, I've had so, one animal not thrive so far since I so, since we started. So, no, so is there a threshold where you would go? Hey, I need to see what's going on with this thing. So let's say sixty five gets in and the egg is not out. Will you do it then? If it, if it, is, is there? Like, is there? Yeah, yeah. So right now, I have all of them pit but one. But when I press on it, I can feel that there's still a little bit of liquid, a little membrane. Now, do I feel the snake moving around there? Absolutely. Uh, if it gets to about day 68, I might just go ahead and, like we were talking about earlier, might cut a little V in it, you know, just to see what's going on. But but most of my stuff, I, I haven't had anything any later than 63 or 64, and it's going to be popping out. 
but I do run, like I said, I do run a cooler, a cooler setup. So, but I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to wait. You know, I've got, I, I don't have any problems with something. It's not going to change whether me posting it on Facebook this day or that day, if I, if I cut them on day 55, day 50 or whatever. Have you ever done maternal incubation? No, I want to. I want to try it at least once in my life to say I have. I kind of want to do, I want to try these other things too. It's kind of like um, the whole situation where people are using uh, water or sponges yeah. or people using, you know, I think there's a guy down south that uses Reptichip, you know, as, as, as his media. So just wet, wet, wet bedding. So I'd like to try those other things, but man, right now it's like, Hey, it's, it's like we're trying to reinvent the wheel here. What's working for me is working, so I'm I'm not willing to to say, hey, we need to change this or anything. I might experiment eventually if I get something that's outside of our plans. But man, everything we're doing right now, we've got a reason for it. So, and like you see people like um, you know, I'm in Justin's Patreon and uh, he does a cuttings all the time, and um, he doesn't use any um, he used the vermiculite or whatever, right? Eggs right on yeah. that stuff too, and. Yeah. Almost every clutch, he pulls open the uh, the pressing seal, and there's a rotted, rotted out egg in there that looks yep. super wet, super like the two. A part of me is like, man, I'm just gonna mail him some easy hash trays and then just see if he'll, uh, <laughs> yeah, and see if he'll ever change it. <laughs> but but knowing Justin, I don't think he'll ever switch up the way he's done things because you know that's just the way it is. That's just the way and, it is. You know, and a lot of successful people, man, are just creatures of habit, man. So if you like, if you always cut eggs for years and years and years, I don't see those people ever like getting changed over to like just not cut it and vice versa too you know like um i don't know if you guys know who jerry robertson is um yeah he uh you know he has a lot of the facebook groups like on there too and um yeah he does like the yellow belly complex stuff he does he does some crazy stuff for specter and um, yeah. he's a he's a head radius anthic head too um he he, he is absolutely gets cut into, you know he's like hey man let, I'm gonna let the chips fall where they may. Whatever happens, yep. happens too. And he's yep. adamant about that. Where you got the other guy? Um, I guess I think Skip Bates is his name, or that's the name he goes by on face on Facebook. Um, he's all about like paternal incubation for the most part and things too, yep. and natural pipping and oh, it's like so. It's just uh, cool to be around a lot of people with different ideas of what works for them, man. So yeah, um, what I've noticed that it, it, there's more extreme people. Yeah. with the cutting you know the people that that do the cutting they will they will stand on that mountain with that flag that that cutting is 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 the way to go and like well like january 7th at the at the capitol building stand by the, <laughs> yeah. their beliefs you know what i mean you know it's like yeah. unbelievable and but but the normal people are like hey we just don't cut it's just like Mate, we don't cut but you do you have them crazy ones that want to do it all straight like like they like they've been doing it since the 1800s and just let let them work and all yeah, that stuff. My issue with, with a lot of those the extremists on one or the other is the ones who care what other people are doing. Yeah, yeah, my, exactly. The, my biggest issue with the cut or no cut thing, it's always going to be something we argue about. It's going to be a never in ASF noise, this versus yep. that forever. But my issue is the people like there's people who like blacklist breeders go, I would not purchase from this breeder if he yep. hacks and slash these eggs and I'm like, that's yep. just crazy. I'm like, who are you going to get? <laughs> like, you know, a lot of people who say they don't cut eggs are, are some of them are lying. Yeah, I think oh, I know. you know that? Dude, there is so many people that um, you know, that stand on one side of the fence in this breeder hobby, and then they will be in a comment section type of what they do and what they don't, but when you call them to the pulpit and it's time to talk about it intelligently, crickets. It's it's so hard to do uh, a lot of quantifiable research with mm -hmm. like anything, but right now I think the ASF rat debate you can you know do quantifiable research that okay if a snake eats ASF his whole life same amount of meals as rats okay which one grows quicker? It's hard to do it with with eggs because there's so many things that could or couldn't happen. So you can't say okay if I didn't cut this egg, it would survive there's no way to tell like again same female can lay the same amount of eggs and do them the exact same way two years in a row and something goes crazy wrong with one and one just is perfect so that's the reason i find this like it's an easy and hard you you pick your you, you kind of pick your side and you say okay i see how you can do it the other way uh but it's hard to find the research that says okay 
a hundred percent of of cuts survive or a hundred percent of this survive because it doesn't and you never know what change could have could have you know changed the outcome of a thriving snake or a non-thriving snake so tyler so right now walk us through the process so like if we were all closing our eyes in imagination land i want to be as descriptive as possible and walk through your precise cutting method i mean like what do you like what day you looking at what do you see when you open up the tub what's what's going on in your mind all of that stuff like exactly what size scissors or blades or whatever you do walk us through that whole a cut process of what you do so that way we can have in our reference and why you do it the way you do it yeah so i usually put the eggs away and my eyes, are, my eyes are closed too so i'm imagining so i do not <laughs> touch the eggs until <laughs> day 55 i'll go in i'll open the tub and if i look at the eggs and i can just see they're desiccated and i can pinch you know a pretty good flap on the top then i'll cut them 100 percent no no problem i will if it's on day 55 or 56 sometimes i'm at shows or whatever when i got a cut so sometimes my eggs do go to day 60 or something crazy for and and i don't cut them right away on day 55 but usually as soon as i see them desiccated and it's past day 55 i'll just make sure i can get a decent flap on the top and get a good cut with you know kitchen scissors i actually have my scissors right there. I want to grab them quick. So these are my main scissors. They're just normal scissors. And I'll make usually a big slit with those. And sometimes if needed, I do have these two. Usually I use the dull edge scissors if i need to cut around a little bit inside the egg and these ones i have maybe used five times on just you know cutting edges here and there but these do 99 percent of the egg cutting i have and again i just make sure i can get a good flap make sure as many veins as possible are away from my cut and obviously the snake isn't so you cut so, so you cut like a semicircular flat or do you, yeah that's what i did straight across I, or i do i do a straight across kind of yeah. kind of like what billy does he'll make the pinch on the top and he'll cut mm -hmm. straight across i last year tried the uh the like u-shape method with a flat and i don't know which one i like better i think they do kind of the same thing so uh I just gave it a shot last year with, with the U-shape, but I did find I cut about 10 times more veins with that. Yeah. So yeah. if I'm making a video, which I, I always do like egg, egg cutting videos and post them on my Instagram, it just looks like a bloody mess inside the egg. So you can never see, you know, what I got. And it's a lot less, you know, gross in my opinion to like just do the, the top flap and cut it straight across you can push both sides of the egg and it opens up a little bit and you can get a better look. And <laughs> I, had a, back <laughs> I had a revelation last season. No, was, I think two seasons ago, I was just, it was just uh, some double hats I was making. I don't even remember what the pair it was. And I think uh, I just happened to remember it, it was in there. It was like day 58. I was like, huh? I let the clutch go this long. I cut that thing. I was like, huh? No veins at all. Huh. I see no fluid. Huh. Oh, it's a it's whole babies in here with almost no umbilical cord or nothing. I was like, this is dope, yo. <laughs> so okay. it was just like, you know, that was like the furthest I've been in a long time without cutting and then just realizing that, you know, like I really didn't even have to at all because it was the egg was just so soft and leathery at that point where it, I don't think it even needed an egg tooth. It could have just like bumped his head into it it broke the egg apart too so um that was kind of relieving where i didn't have to deal with like blood and mining veins and stuff like that too man so um do you do you cut on day 58 now because of that or do you still you know cut on day 55 <laughs> i cut it i cut day i cut day nine what you talking about <laughs> <laughs> I think I, like, I think I saw a I'm comment like, from yolk, Will. Yolk smoke. Oh. I don't care about that. Oh, 
my favorite comment tonight was if you cut on day 35, every pairing has uh, bells in it. Yeah, every, so, every pairing's a bell. <laughs> that was a great comment. Yeah, I tried. I try to do like um, anywhere between 54 and 56 in that time frame, just depending on how the egg's looking. If it's still a little bit tough, unless it's having, unless I'm having issues. So um, this stranger clutch I just did, um, it was like day 50 or 51, and they looked bad. Like they looked like really, really bad. And I was like, man, these things. It was five eggs, and I was like, man, these things are probably dead in here. And um, they weren't. But when I made some small cuts, but uh, okay. end up two out of the five ended up surviving. So like no stranger stuff. I hit a red strike, which I proved out the mail, and that red strike been which I didn't know, which kind of pushed me forward with that project almost two years, which is cool. And I hit a red strike double head hypo clown and a GHI <laughs> double head hypo clown, and the stranger clown didn't make it, and the other stuff didn't make it. So that kind of sucked. But the part of my head is like, man. If I just would have let it go, would it would it would they have made it? You know, you always question yourself now. That's, so that's, the, that, that's the one thing I yeah, that's the one thing I don't like about um like if something happens after I cut a clutch and maybe it was a little bit too early, I'm like, okay, I cut it earlier than I normally do and it didn't make it. So one plus one is two. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So again, it's it's hard for me, like I'm no actual biologist, but you know, the five days it takes 55 to 60 or whatever. And they're not usually for me out of the egg until about day 62 ish. They're fully out. But I think like it's so hard for me. Not I've never had an egg that has gone bad, you know, towards the end usually it happens like really quick and they mold but all the snakes that i've cut and just haven't survived there's been i've seen you know you know reasons for it like the two two i cut this year just never came out of the egg didn't survive they were came um everything else just came out of the egg and, and done pretty damn well so i i don't know a reason to switch for myself and I always, for, for all breeders, whatever works for you, works for you. And I'm happy that it works for you. You know what I mean? So I when you come across a situation with a kink, is it something where, are you, are you going back? Are you going, Hey, maybe I need to change my heat. Or are you just marking it up as maybe just genetics or whatever? Is it something where you're going back after it's over said and done said, how can I avoid kinks in the future? Or are you just kind of, kind of rolling with the percentages? Look, I, I had two kinks this year and one was kind of out of, I mean, both were kind of out of the blue, but I, I stick with the logic that, you know, I've, I've stuck to this whole show where it happens. There's nothing I can do now. And I don't know if there's anything I could have done to fix it besides, I mean, one of the animals that was kinked this year had black pastel in it, but it wasn't super. It was a banana yellow, or no, sorry. It was a black pastel yellow belly pied male to a banana pied female. So it was a banana black pastel yellow belly pied. And it just, I cut the egg open and it was kinked. It just never came out. So never soaked, soaked up enough yolk even in there. I think when I cut it, it was dead. But, you know, I, I sit back with everything that happens and if they're out of the egg and they're not eating or if they're out of the egg and there's something I can hundred percent do to fix it, I'm going to do everything I can to fix it. But it's hard for me to say, okay, this snake would have fully developed. The snake would have not been kinked. The snake would have eaten its first meal if I didn't cut it on day 55 and I just let it come out of the egg on day 60. Yeah. So I kind of roll with, you know, whatever happens, happens. I just think the age old question comes down to, are you really increasing or decreasing the odds by doing it? I mean, right. I think that's ultimately what it's going to come down to. Um, it's going to be another one of those things that are personal preference. Um, I just know me personally over the couple hundred of eggs that I've had that my success rates been that I've had one that failed to thrive. And when we did the necropathy, there was something where the, the, uh, um, 
the uh, intestines were tied up. So it wasn't getting to the point to where it was able to process the meal that it was taking. So um, as far as like knock on, knock on wood, of course, as far as like anything physical, as far as a uh, shark mouth or missing an eye or, you know, anything like that, uh, we just haven't had that issue. So, um, like I said, more than more than anything, it, it just it's going to come down to preference and the people that I relied on to help me get started in this, and back into this hobby and and look at it as like a, 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 a as a business. It all made sense to just to just leave them be and 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 let let the snake Jesus figure out whether they need to be there or not. Yeah, I think one thing that I hope to see, you know, in the next few years, and just you know, going on to the future in the reptile industry, but specifically the ball python industry is as people get more into it, science gets more involved and involved, uh, that there's more quantifiable research for all these debates we're having now. So five years in the future, we can say, okay, the people on one side, okay, if they're still on that side, they're stubborn, you know, or it doesn't matter what you do. It's just your preference. So, you know, maybe five years down the road, we figure out that ASFs are three times better than rats just by research. Or if you right. cut your eggs, you have, you know, 10% less viability. If that comes out, it's going to take a long, long time and a lot of research, a lot of studies. Then I, I really can't wait for that because it'll help everyone. And just having these, you know, debates now is very helpful to get, you know, people. I don't think you're going to, again, like Antoine said, switch anyone's minds, but it just lets everyone know there's different viewpoints and it works for everyone. Right. So. And um, when you do have egg issues, me personally, I've had the same incubator now since 2015, I want to say. And um, I bought it used. It's a, uh, you know, old Pepsi fridge with the, with the glass door or whatever like that. And it was just problems after problems after problems, like every season or every time I incubated something like one, they had way too much heat tape in it. Right. So mm -hmm. it was like the 11 inch heat tape, but it was like along the back on one side on the other side, just a whole lot for no reason. And then I actually remember uh, my friend Jason Goodwin seeing a picture of it when I got it. And he goes, man, that's way too much heat tape. You don't need that. Less is more. Take the, take the sides off and leave the strip in the back. I'm like, oh, man, you know what you're talking about, bro. I was like, man, this guy here is been producing, you know, blah, blah, blah. First clutch in there. Bad. Fried, terrible, all, all the eggs failed. So I'm like, huh. <laughs> Rip those off, back in. <laughs> Next clutch, fine. Then I moved the incubator to my wall to the trail I lived in. And at high noon, the sun hits right in front of that wall. So yeah. I had the incubator backed up to that wall. One day I came home for lunch on a hot summer day in August in the desert. And the thermometer in that thing said 106. Oh, shit. And it was a clutch of GHI Hattie's Antics almost 10 years ago. <laughs> all Dang. fail. Dream Tickle clutch. All fail. Yeah. So having to adjust to that. And it also came, like, he built, like, two fans into it, too. Like, the small computer yeah. fans. So the air can circulate, too. So um, a couple years. So I moved away from there and didn't have any issues for a long time. And then the fans went out. So I was like, man, the fans went out here. But instead of me running um, fans and replacing those two, I'll just put it towards the bottom and have a better fan at the base of the incubator circulating and everything like that. Had a, so first season, I, well, the first clutch I had with the new fan, kinks everywhere. Mm. Four or five clutches, wow. like like back kinks, like right the little bump above the tail. And I'm like, yeah. man, I wonder why is that so... Just out of curiosity, I took like a small deli cup and set it in there with water and washed it. And for 60 days, the, uh, the, all, it's just vibrating, uh, like, like vibrating like this, like really, really slow. You can see it moving. So now I'm cooking scrambled eggs. So I'm like, yeah. okay, that has, to, that has to be the problem. So then I removed the fan from there. And now um, I don't have a fan in there at all. And now everything's coming out fine. You know, except for like the clutches not cut early and things like that too. So it's just to me always is troubleshooting everything and moving these variables out and actually, you know, being critical about them, like save like the egg cut issues and stuff too. So my biggest issue is always like frying the eggs and kinks and things like that. So everybody else, 
when you if every if your incubator is on point and all your temperatures are the same and everything's fine, you have sensor pushes and stuff like that, and you're having a bunch of failed clutches and you're cutting your eggs at 51, 52, one stop cutting that early, you know, <laughs> move a little bit further along later, have a little bit more patience. And if that's also the problem after that, then maybe you need to look at some other factors and figure out why your stuff isn't working out. So, I mean, whether it is cutting or not, um, you are people, everyone's going to do what they want to do. You know, um, sometimes ask, I cut, ask sometimes. you this, ask you this, Antoine, do you rotate your, do you rotate your yeah. boxes? So whenever I do, um, whenever I have like more than four in there, I just, I move them out. So I think I move them like once, like every week I go in there and just swap them around too. I never, okay. I never, I never burp my eggs. I never, um, like peek in there and check on them too. Like once they're in there, like until it's time to open, I, they don't get open again, you know? So like, do you want to like, or do you just move them to another row? Unless there's some weird smell in there. Like I turn, I move them and I turn them around too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I do that, and um, it's just something I just started doing maybe two seasons ago, and um, it messed up my OCD a little bit because like I like seeing my clutch cards with the right clutch numbers in the miracle order too. Yeah. But now I don't even do um, I don't do clutch cards anymore as of this year. I I use the wow. clutch app, so I just put a little yeah. mark on there with the clutch number, and I know how to refer to that, you know, with, with my phone, and then just do it like that. So nice. Yeah, man. So it saved me a lot of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of extra admin work, man. So, but um, well, the only thing that I'll probably do is, uh, you know, I've got the big 48 inch that Christmas Sea Serpents made uh, with the, that double wall insulation. I think the only thing that I might do if I ever make a change was I will just stack a bunch of 24 inches. You know what I mean? Because I just noticed that that the way ambient tends to change from shelf to shelf when you get into those bigger incubators uh that there's there's a lot of radiant difference uh with those and i think if it's something where i could have you know one either 24 or 36 and just have a have a wall of them and knowing that 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 one right there i don't have to mess with these if i need to get to these and then i'm not having to touch them at all that that might be some route we go uh, with how we're doing things I think they might need to add another fan. They have double fans in the 60, but not in the 48. But I agree. Mm -hmm. I have the 48 in the difference. Oh, there's doubles now. Mine's got two. Oh, okay. Yeah, I only have one. So I see the difference. Yeah. And yeah. I, yes. So that's interesting. I've I been thinking about double fanning and seeing if it works. Honestly, dude, I'm after, after I moved from this house um, in the fall, I'm done with incubators, period. I'm doing a walk in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we thought like, about I that just, too. If we I, if we go I, that route, I just I just see so many success stories and people with better stuff. Like uh, aside from Justin, uh, Josh from Ball Python Shed, yep. he has a walk in. Um, uh, MJ, he has a walk in now at his new place, and it, it's nice, man. He's just in there, and then especially when you can just like get the temperature dialed in right, um, where you can like literally just walk in that bad boy, close yourself in there, and do what you got to do instead of keeping the thing open, you know. Yep. So I like that, man. When I go on my thing, for like two seconds, it start beep, 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 and the dogs start going crazy, you know. So um, I'm definitely going to walk in route. Even if I don't do a whole lot of crazy amount of clutches, I just think that it's, that's just um, it's better for filming, too. You know, more room. You can circulate air the way you want it to. Right. And it's really, it's really not that expensive. Some people I know use, um, like, the little oil heaters for yeah. it and yeah. um some people like justin just has 11 inch heat tape on the ceiling with the probe down there and two fans yeah. in the top and bottom corner and that's it man so yeah with the with the regular like walking closet shelves the whole the whole everything in it's that simple so yeah i think I'm yeah i think going, it was i think it was balls to you was the one i saw was like yeah that's dope mm -hmm. that's the one that's the route i'd like to go i mean yeah. i don't want to i don't want to take money out of uh will banks and c service pockets by saying that but i mean <laughs> I, I hope sure everyone one day wants to walk in. You know, yep. I want I want to walk in here in the next two three years. I'll probably get a walk in, make one over there. Oh man, this damn Alice is kicking my ass here, man, in this damn country. <laughs> there was there was a point I wanted to bring up, but I'm gonna try to think. I couldn't remember what it was. We were talking. Oh yeah, so we were talking earlier about. Um, well, two things were going on at once, and I forgot exactly what I was like, what I was going to say. But yeah, you know, the egg cutting almost comes down to uh, how it looks as a hobby. You know, we right. got to think about this: how many other people 
that either breeds some sort of animal do some sort of, of cutting to that thing. Now, let's not keep in mind, I know like there's, when you get the dogs, there's ones that they're better to have C-sections and have a natural birth. I get that. Mm. But in situations where like people that breed monitors and people that breed, so are they cutting their stuff? No, they're, they're leaving them be. So, you know, they're, they're trying, they're not, we're the, basically the only hobby and the only people that, that do this. So, and somebody brought up a good point when we're talking, um, I don't, I, I don't, I don't people that like, are, like you, you know that for a fact or cause, because I, I, I don't know, honestly, cause I never really talked well, to people. When I asked never, around, cause you know, of course I did my research when right. we started going that route mm -hmm. and a lot of people were in, you know, it brought up a good point. This like, we're literally the only hobby that does. We're also the only ones that kind of sort of brag about it as well and i think it was somebody that um brought it up that in canada they're having issues with animal activists uh going to their pages and and reporting that they're doing some sort of type of animal abuse because they're they're cutting the eggs and letting them out too soon so it's not that that's wrong or right and that i'm taking the animal activist side of things right. but it does at the end leave a black eye for our community and and what we do so that's wait that's a minute, another wait, thing. Hey, hey, first of all, watch your fucking mouth. I'm a black guy in this community. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I'm 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 a throwing this shitty joke at one. At one. <laughs> no, no. Nah, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying, man. And you always gonna have those extremists, you know what I mean, yeah. who come out and just you know say some outlandish stuff like that, man. And and that's wild, man. But well, I, what up, Tyler? You yeah, I think with that, you know, the Peter animal activist people are, yeah, they always show anyone in a bad light who has any kind of animal. So there's no appeasing them at all. Yeah, they don't want us to have pets, people, period. <laughs> but yeah, people who know, no, if you, if you know what I mean. Ball python people, if you're into it, you know each way is fine as long as everything's good. I've never heard of a lizard breeder uh gecko breeder and amphibian person shit on the ball python industry because we cut eggs because okay. again they understand they know uh so it's it's hard to take you know the outside perspective of really anyone but especially like an animal activist group who do have hard topics of snake shows and think they live in you know bins like that at snake shows but uh yeah, I agree. It can leave a, a black eye to the community in, you know, from the outside looking in. Yeah, we need to maybe you say something different because I don't like how y'all keep talking about black eyes. Black so, eyes. Anyway, yeah. you know, yeah. um, <laughs> but yeah, man, let's, it's gonna be okay, let's, 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 let's say this right here. If you were working your table and you had a bunch of kids walk up and they were like, you know, I want to do this when I get older. I'm thinking about doing that. And they asked you, would you recommend cutting eggs for them? I'd say, yeah. I, okay. I would say, yeah. Uh, but always a caveat to all my advice is do your research. Like, don't flip your eggs upside down and cut the snake. Don't cut them with the razor straight down. Like, do your research. Do it, you know, in a good way. I think as long as what you're doing isn't just notably horrible, right? Dude, I don't like beginners popping and probing their snakes. Yeah, how many, how many how many pictures you see in groups? They were like, "Hey, is this a male?" And they push it the wrong way, I, and they and they got their thumb up the snake's ass and shit, and you know, like that shit. And I'm like, so you're like, yeah, I'm gonna try to probe. No, no, if you can't pop right, you probably can't probe right either. You probably jabbing this poor thing's hemipenes to oblivion. You know, so this is one of those things, man. Anything you do like that, where it's like a minor veterinary procedure or anything as far as like sex and two, like find the actual physical mentor or somebody that can come show you in person. You know, there's there's a lot of people. I don't know if you guys have got it at shows that ask me to pop their snake, like teach them how to pop a snake. And I always I show them and I'm like, go find someone who can show you all the time in person because yeah it's you can do damage like probing a snake the wrong way or, or popping a snake the wrong way and me showing you for 30 seconds because i can do it quickly doesn't show you you know how to do that and i i think the same thing goes with everything in the hobby 
and, and everyone says, do your research because you're going to mess some stuff up. So yeah, no matter what, you're going to mess your stuff up. But the more research you do, the less chance you have at, at messing stuff up. Yeah, man. Just, and, and it was it was cool about our community now is that it's okay to ask those rookie questions to people, you know? Right. It's, it's, it wasn't always like that, you know? No, it wasn't. Like, I'll, I don't know if you guys saw that thing with the Green Tree Python thing uh, last week, but I asked a legit question on the Facebook page. The guy was slamming some breeder for having, um, I guess, wild-caught uh, green trees, but passing them off as, you know, as a uh, captive yeah. uh, hatched. Okay. And all I said was, hey, man, uh, I'm curious as to what brought you to that conclusion as a ball python breeder, somebody play on getting the green trees in the near future, you know, well, how could you tell? This motherfucker went off. You're a ball python breeder, so you shouldn't keep away from our snakes and maybe try Kenyan sand boas. Ah, like this motherfucker. Then come to find out this dude is some fucking asshole who doesn't even support the US Ark and just hates ball python breeders, period. Huh. For whatever reason, because he's a miserable human being, and when I see him, it's on site, by the way. But um, that's a whole other um <laughs> topic, so you know. But that's how ball python breeding was back in the day. You go on those forums and stuff, you ask a question, they're like, Oh, look at this new peer, blah blah blah. And okay, give me some pertinent information or a place of good resource that I can go to and look this stuff up. And if you want me to figure out my own, you know, give me a bet a good place to start, don't just ridicule me, you know what I mean. So, oh, there was there were several wolf tickets that were sold back in the day when you were when you were in some of those things. They just they wanted you to fail. They didn't want to run the risk of yeah. the chance of you being somebody that, that takes their shine or ma makes them lose a sale. So they were killing you everything wrong, like microwave and mice and stuff like that. They would tell you anything just to kind of throw you off your game that they could live together and you never have to separate them. It was crazy. As they, it, like was, it, it was wild as they'll try to sell you an animal, but then. Don't give you the right information to take care of the damn thing. Right. 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 Yeah. I I was I was lucky and unlucky. You know, mainly going to shows when I was younger, I would get no attention, even though I was buying snakes. And again, I'd tell people I wanted to breed and I was like 10 years old and they'd laugh at me. But whatever, I'd probably I don't laugh at kids like that because I was that, but I can understand why they did. Um, but I was lucky enough, you know, really early on to find someone who one one breeder who you know gave me some information and helped me out and since then obviously you know i was 11 when i met the guy and now he's out but since then i've grown my my network of breeders a lot more but yeah the ball python even yeah from when i was a young i'm not gonna say a kid because to all you guys i still am a kid um but you know, since and uh, Moose so, old ass, I, I'm still a kid, so I mean, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's changed in the eight years that I've been, you know, seven years I've been breeding, and eleven years I've been keeping ball pythons. So I and it's going to change in the next eleven years. I know, for and us. I hope it, so. it keeps changing the way it has. Where you know, there's still idiots and dumbasses, but hopefully there's a lot less than there was. And I hope, you know, 11 years from now, there's a lot less than there are now. And it's just, all right, all right, you two, before, before we go, Hey Moose, what, what genius to invest in? What's the next big thing? Go. I believe the next big thing that we're going to get into uh, is if we're able to get it happening, I'm going to go pretty hard with Cosmos. Cosmos, Tyler, next big thing. What, what, what do I invest in? Monarch. Ooh, you go ahead. You just triggered some ultra male people. Uh oh. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Hey man, I appreciate you guys coming on, man. This was a fun talk. The comment section was was lit. Um, just a couple little stragglers in there that didn't hit that like button. So do that before we get up out of here. Big shout to my man Frank Rossi or Rossi Reptiles for bringing this podcast to us, man. As usual, follow him on IG, Rossi underscore reptiles. Thank you, Tyler's Toxic Balls. Thank you, Moose and Great Balls of Fryer. Both of their Instagrams are in the description down below right now. Check those guys out, man. There's some amazing human beings and some dope ball python breeders, man. And I appreciate you guys coming through in the pitch for me and uh, helping put this thing together, man. Like, you know, fucking, you, obviously, when you guys are like real good friends, man. And then I appreciate you looking at y'all like this when you didn't have to, you know. No, so, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, 
Thank you, my guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, since you missed Tinley, this is the only chance I get to see you. Right. <laughs> I didn't I didn't get to beat you up on the mat this time because I was telling everyone I was. Yeah. I was I really beat <laughs> shout you up. Out, shout out to the chat, man. Like, share, subscribe. That notification bell. Smack that bad boy so you know every time a new episode comes out, which I may end up changing the time slot to like an hour early because there's some other pods that come on uh, at the same time and – I figured, like, it's no point of both of us, like, fighting for viewers for that one, too. You know what I mean? So, trying to No, plant your flag, man. You were first. You plant your flag. <laughs> you plant your flag. <laughs> uh, work around so, you, homie. So, we'll, so, we'll see how that works out, man. Uh, so, uh, but Proper Warriors is a good guy, man. That's my homie, too. So, I don't really – if we can figure yeah, something out. Yeah, that's Shane. Shane's on that one right now, so. Yeah, yep. So, um. But, yeah, man, good night, everybody. Appreciate you guys. Hey, you guys stay here for a little bit till we get up yeah. out of here. Till next time, deuces.